When Jesus calls a man, he calls him to come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in writing those words, was not referring to his impending death at the hands of Nazi Germany. Rather, he was really reflecting on the same spiritual reality that Martin Luther wrote about several hundred years prior when he said in the first of his 95 theses nailed on the church door in Wittenberg that when Jesus commands all men to repent, he is bidding them to live a whole life of repentance. It's the same thought that Paul is expressing in Colossians chapter 3. So I'd ask you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We'll be beginning in verse 5. As we enter this second half of Colossians, it's very, very important that we don't lose sight of what has come before in the book, this letter. We're going to see lots of very practical Christian living in these chapters. Lots of do these things. Don't do these things. And we have to remember through all of it that Christ is the foundation for all of these commands. We're, we're not doing any of this on our own power, for our own merit, to earn our own salvation. We're doing these things because of who Christ is and because of what he has done for us. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were made through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. It's with Christ in whom we've been buried with him by faith, in baptism and in faith we've been raised with him by the powerful working of God. It's in Christ that we've died to the elemental principles of the world. It's with Christ that we've been raised. It's with Christ, it's in Christ that our life is hidden. And it's with Christ that our glory will appear when he appears. And in light of those things, therefore, Paul writes, Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouths. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So there's it's really just, just one command in what we're looking at tonight, repeated a few times. That command is put to death what is earthly in you. And the foundation for that is, is what we've already seen over the past several weeks. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. As Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a constant theme in Paul's writings that the Christian life is a life that has been crucified or buried, united with Christ in his death, and also united with him in his resurrection. John MacArthur has called this passage, this, this idea of really a spiritual suicide. That's what conversion is. You're dying to yourself so that you might live in Christ. And this is already true positionally or statively of all Christians. You 
if you're in Christ, truly have died. But now, in the flesh, you must continue on the work of putting to death these earthly things. It's what Paul talks about in, in Romans 7. How in his flesh there, there dwells no good thing, and in the flesh is waging war against the Spirit, and he has the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out, and, and victory is only found in Christ Jesus. So that this is not a call to reform your life, to clean yourself up, but, as Paul writes in, in Romans 8, 13, to, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. going to look at this slightly out of order. It always bugs me when I have to do this, um, but, but I think it is the, the best way to understand this passage. First, we need to see why. Why do we need to put to death the deeds of the flesh? And we're told that in verses 6 and 7. And then verses 5 and 8 give us lists of these earthly things that need to be put to death. So why? Why do we need to Put to death what is earthly in us. Why can't we just celebrate our freedom in Christ and live however we want? Why not go on sinning that grace may abound? Two reasons. First, verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. God hates sin. And God is angry with sin. And if we are in Christ, if we are a new creation, if our life is hidden with Christ, then by the miracle of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we have come to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. Christianity isn't just a get out of jail free card where we can indulge in our sins pray this prayer of repentance and then just wave our guilt in God's face as we avoid all of the consequences to be a Christian to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit is to love what God loves and to hate what God hates and God hates sin it is an affront to his holy character it is, it is rebellion against the king of creation. It's treason. It's wrong. It should be abhorrent to Christians. We should hate it not just because of the consequences, but because it is distasteful to us. Because we know and we feel that it is wrong. And God's wrath and God's wrath is coming on account of these sins. God's already demonstrated his wrath against sin once in the days of Noah, many times, but against the entire world in the days of Noah, when he destroyed the entire world with water. It was demonstrated again on Sodom and Gomorrah when the cities were consumed by fire, serving as an example to us. And Peter tells us that the world is going to be destroyed by fire. The wrath of God is coming because of these things. So we must avoid them and put them to death in ourselves. And we... There's a, there's a tension in the Christian life The fact is that, that no matter how hard we strive, we're not going to be completely successful in putting to death what is earthly in us. Um, the Heidelberg Catechism says even the holiest of us still in this life make only small advances in holiness and still bear much sin in us. Martin Luther in Latin 
which I'm not going to quote in Latin, you don't need to know that, had a phrase that sounds better in Latin. We can talk about it later if you want. But is simultaneously just <coughs> and a sinner. That's, that's who we are. There's still sin that dwells in us. Even as we strive to put it to death, there's still sin in us. We shouldn't fear the wrath of God on account of that. Because we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And the record of, of guilt stood against us with its legal demands have been nailed to the cross. But that again, doesn't mean that we can just be tolerant of sin in our lives. Um, we, we read it a few weeks ago in Numbers 15. Numbers 1530, I think, is one of the most essential verses for American Christianity. It's been almost utterly forgotten. And that's this promise that whoever sins with a high hand, whether he be native or sojourner, reviles the Lord and shall be cut off from the people. Even in the Old Testament, there's this elaborate sacrificial system. You perform the sacrifices, your guilt is removed. But if you sin with a high hand, which means, okay, I know this is wrong, I know God hates it, but I'm going to do it anyway because then I can perform a sacrifice and it'll be okay. If you sin that way, you're cut off from the people. And the same is true in the New Covenant. You, you can't twist and abuse the grace of God into sensuality and immorality. You, you can't just go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. If you do that, there's nothing awaiting you but the wrath of God. Don't abuse and pervert the grace of God. Don't bring yourself under the wrath of God. You know that God hates these things. Therefore, put them to death. Second reason why we need to put these things to death, verse 7, is in these you too once walked when you were living in them. Past tense. You used to walk in these things. You used to live in these things, but no more. These things are no longer fitting your life in Christ. You've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new is coming to be. Don't get Peter. It says that the time that has passed more than suffices for doing these things that the Gentiles want to do. We've been changed. We've been regenerated, redeemed, reborn. Reconciled to God, we should no longer live as we once did. So, so many of us live lives as though we've never truly been raised from death. As if we were still under the power of the old self, under the power of the world in which we once walked, under slavery to sin. But we don't live in those things anymore. We don't live to those things anymore. We've been set free by the will of Christ, by the grace of Christ. Can you imagine, after the Civil War, when, really, after, after the Civil War, when the slaves were finally all free, the slave going back to his former master, man who had beat him and abused him and exploited him, Going back and just saying, I want to be your slave again. That's what we do so often when we tolerate and accept and, and even cherish these sins in our lives.
We used to walk in these things. We used to live in these things. We do so no longer. So put to death what is earthly in you. So what are these things that we need to put to death? Again, it's prerogatives, whatever is earthly in you, it, it's expansive. These lists are not exhaustive, but, but they're, they're exemplary, they're examples of those things. First list, everything in the list is, is related. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So sexual immorality, Greek word is this porneia, it's, it's where pornography word comes from. It, it refers to any sexual activity outside the bounds of what God has prescribed, which is within marriage. Within a marriage as God has ordained marriage between a man and a woman committed to each other for life. seems more and more, but it's, it's not new in human history, but the world revolves around sexual immorality. If we look at 90% of what's disrupting our society today, it, it revolves around sexual immorality. The gay rights movement, transgenderism, the AIDS epidemic, abortion, are all effects of sexual immorality. <clears throat> sexual immorality doesn't, doesn't just spring up by itself out of, out of nothing. Sexual immorality comes from impurity. Impurity is really it's, it's the step leading up to sexual immorality. It, it's not the act of sexual sin, but it, it's the, the thoughts, the not, not just having the thoughts, but cultivating the thoughts of these sexual sins, the, the treasuring of them, the longing for them. It, it's what Jimmy Carter was admitting to when he said that he never cheated on his wife, but he committed adultery in his heart many times. This is the, the impurity. We can't just think that well, because I'm not acting out these sexual sins, then it's, it's okay. You can't just have an active thought life or, or fantasy life. As Jesus rightly said in the Sermon on the Mount, that if you gaze at a woman with lustful intent, you've already committed adultery with in your heart. That one sin leads to another sin, but they're both sinful. They're both earthly. They both must be put to death. This impurity grows out of passion and evil desire. The, the two words are very nearly synonyms. And I really think the, the adjective evil could be attached to both of them. There, there's nothing wrong inherently with having passion or having desire. The issue is when those desires and passions are evil. What makes them evil is, is that they're outside what God's given to us, what he's set before us, what he's commanded for us, what he's provided for us. Those things grow out of covetousness. Covetousness is seeing something that's not yours and saying, I want that. In whatever area, in, in whatever way, whether it's it's desiring a, a woman that you don't have, a car that you don't have, a job that you don't have, position, respect, abilities, families, whatever it is, when you want something that hasn't been given to you. You're jealous of somebody else for having these things. When you determine, I must have these things, that is covetousness. 
It's what leads to these evil desires. It's desires to have something that's not rightly yours. So it leads to impurity and sexual immorality. And Paul says that this covetousness is idolatry. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us at first because we generally don't go around coveting after other people's stone Buddha statues or other religious iconography. So how can we say that covetousness is idolatry? It's because idols are far more expansive than we think they are. Leonard Ravenhill was right when he said that anything that you love more than you love God is an idol. And that's what covetousness is. It's saying, remember, God is sovereign over all things. Every good gift comes down from above. Whatever you have has been given you by God. And covetousness says, God, you haven't given me enough. Or you haven't given me the right things. I don't want this thing that you gave me. I want that thing that you gave someone else. saying, I'm willing to sin to get this thing that I want that you didn't give to me. It's saying, this thing, whatever it is, whether, it's, again, Ten Commandments uses the example of both, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's donkey, whether it's possessions or people, whatever it is, say, I care more about this than I care about God. It's what ruined Solomon's life, his desire for foreign wives, he saw them, he longed for them, he broke the commandments of God to get them. It's what ruined, very nearly ruined David's life with Bathsheba. She was not his wife, but he saw her and desired her and sent for her and took her and murdered for her and lied for her. And it devastated his family. But it all grows out of, again, this self-centeredness that desires what it doesn't have and is willing to sin for what God has not given. And it must be put to death. But in verse 8, we get another list. It's a very different list. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouths. Do not lie to one another. So, this time, in verse 5, he went kind of in reverse order from the end result to the causes. Now he's going from causes to end results. You must put away anger and wrath. Have a lot of people in this room of Irish extraction. Um, and it's proverbial how hot-tempered the Irish can be. And people with red hair. Yes. Maybe it's true. Maybe the Irish are somehow more predisposed, whether it be through genetics or culture or whatever, maybe they are more predisposed towards anger. It doesn't matter not an excuse. You can never say about sin, well, I was born this way. We were all born totally <clears throat> depraved, predisposed for sin, utterly opposed to God. That's why you know, the Bible said, okay, yes, that's a natural part of you, and you need to put it off. You need to put it to death. It is not a family condition. It's not a cultural trait. It is sin that you must put away. 
You cannot be quick tempered. Whenever things don't go your way, you cannot get angry and explode in rage at other people. This anger and wrath is almost a synonym for, for anger. Wrath is, is going beyond just this, this smoldering, smoking anger to a white-hot fury that explodes and causes damage. It's, it'll ruin relationships. It can ruin lives. One bad moment of wrath set on fire the entire course of your life. You're in it forever. You must put it away. Anger and wrath can lead to malice. Malice goes beyond just being angry to actively wishing ill upon other people. To, to be malicious isn't just to be indifferent to other people. It's not just to be primarily focused on yourself. It grows out of that self-centeredness into actively wishing harm upon others. It's not just that I want what you have. It's that I want you to lose it, and I want you to suffer. I want you to be harmed. And even in its mildest forms, this, this anger and wrath and malice leads to slander and obscene talk. Because we are so wrapped up with ourselves, we're so angry at other people because they get in the way of me getting what I want, then we begin to seek to destroy them. And since most of the time we can't do it physically, we do it through our words. We slander them. We destroy their reputation. We, we tarnish their character. We spread lies and unkind and untrue things about them. And that is obscene talk. It doesn't take cursed words for our speech to be obscene. Whenever we are using our lips to tear people down rather than building up one another, then our talk is obscene and blasphemous. Speech must always build one another up. It's so very easy to use them to tear each other down. Along the same lines, verse 9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. Again, lying grows out of self-centeredness because telling the truth would be somehow harmful to me it would get me in trouble or it wouldn't get me something that I want so we lie no I did not take the last cookie no I have no idea how that thing got broken We lie about all sorts of things. But we lie seeking to benefit ourselves at the expense of others. So all these all these earthly things, can they, they all grow out of this self-focus, this self-importance, this self-centeredness. That's what is put to death in Christ when we come to him in repentance and 
Someone, I have, I have no idea who, I'm going to call just the me monster. Focus on ourselves, our desires, our wants, what we think we deserve and, and don't have. And it expresses itself in both of these directions. And pursuing unlawful, evil desires for ourselves, we're tearing others down. But it all comes from a wrong view of self. So that's what we need to put to death. We talked about why we need to put it to death. We get, we're, we're given a couple of uh, synonyms for put to death, same as verse 8, put them all away. Same as verse 9, you have put off the old self with its practices. But so how do we how do we do it? How do we do it? It's interesting, this is a both a past tense and an ongoing process. Verse 9, you have put off the old self with its practices, therefore you must put away all these things. There's, there's two ways to do this. Two ways to put to death the deeds of flesh. It's a positive aspect and a negative aspect. And the positive one is, is far more important. Verse 10, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. You put off the deeds of the flesh by putting on the image of Christ. You put to death the deeds. You put to death what is earthly in you by living the life of Christ in you. This is the destiny of Christians. You know, we, we have a tendency, I think, to use Romans 8, 28 a lot and stop too early. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And a lot of us like to stop there. I mean, it, it's true and it's useful right there, but we need to, to keep going. That for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image his son. And those to be predestined, he also called. And those to be called, he also justified. And those to be justified, he also glorified. So often, even when we think about this, this golden chain of redemption, we just, okay, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. We don't think about what are, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Christian, whatever, whatever happens in this world, that is your destiny to be conformed to the image of Christ. Consider Christ, pursue Christ, imitate Christ. And these things will be put to death. Secondary way to do this, put to death these things. Not, it's not, it's not different. It's complementary to focusing on Christ and pursuing Christ like this. Might even be too much to say that it's complementary. Maybe it'd be better to, to just say it's it's another aspect of the same thing. It's, it's that we, we kill these things by starving them. Sin isn't it's 
not an animal that we hunt. We don't need to learn everything about it and, and master its tendencies and traits and come to a perfect understanding of it so that we can find it and kill it. Kill it. It's, it's already found us. We, we kill it by starving it. If we surround ourselves, and this is hard to do because we, we live in a world saturated with sexual immorality. But if we're constantly hearing and, and seeing and reading and, and watching things that celebrate sexual immorality and impurity and evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, these things influence us. We are much more influenced by the world around us and what we consume than we realize. Put to death what's earthly in you. Avoid and abstain and fight against those things around you that celebrate and rejoice in and embrace these evil, earthly, sinful things. You know what they are, you know where they are, you know what influence they have on you. Maybe we need to turn off the radio, shut down the television, put away the book. It's not a sacrifice too great. Christ said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right foot causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better to enter life blind or crippled or lame than with two eyes, two hands, two feet, to be thrown bodily into hell. Whatever leads you to sin, whatever leads you away from Christ. And I'm not saying nobody, no Christian can have a radio, no Christian can have a television. I'm not going to give you a list of prescribed shows, proscribed shows that you cannot watch. But if something is leading you any sin. Get rid of it. Starve the old nature. Feed the new nature. As Paul wrote in, in Philippians, finally, brothers, if there's anything, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's just, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There's nothing more just, more true, more lovely, more pure, more commendable, more excellent, more praiseworthy than the person of Jesus Christ. To fill your mind with Christ. You will be transformed into his likeness. And the old self will be continually more and more day by day put to death. It's difficult, it's counter-cultural, but it's what God calls us to. It's what Christ has died to provide in our lives. And John Owen was right, though he was writing about Romans 8, it's the same thought. John Owen was right when he said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Don't take this lightly. Don't tolerate sin in your life. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for it your grace poured out in our lives 
for rescuing us from the darkness in which we once lived, from rescuing us from spiritual death by causing us to die to ourselves, we might be raised with Christ. Or make us more Christ by By the Spirit, let us put to death the deeds of flesh, whatever is earthly. May we not cling to the things that are harmful to us and hateful to you. May everyone around us see the image of Christ in us. May we constantly encourage one another to persevere in this call. We ask this, knowing that it's only possible by the work of Christ, the work of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.